Well, good evening, ladies. Well, I figured, you know, we've been talking about anxiety this week. And I have almost a 20-year relationship with anxiety. And I think sometimes sharing what's helped and what hasn't helped and kind of the ins and outs of sharing how someone has dealt with anxiety can be very helpful. And I think it's kind of fitting that we just celebrated 9-11 and part of my anxiety is all wrapped up in 9-11 as well. And it was fear of flying. And so I'm happy to share tonight. If you happen to have any questions or comments, feel free to drop those below. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. And yeah, so anxiety. I am card carrying anxiety person. And, you know, I have flown all over the world. When I was in the military, one of my jobs was to load aircraft. And so I would load up aircraft. I would go to places like Kuwait and Korea and Qatar. And I would have to be on the advance party and I would fly all over the world. I also would fly to planning conferences with joint military uh, players in different countries. I would have to go to Korea two, three times a year and do the direct flight myself. Um, so I, I had this wonderful connection with flying. However, like 20 years ago, there was this weird time and space in my life where my childhood trauma was coming forth and my parents were involved and like the big secret was let out about um, my childhood trauma. And I never really thought that that would ever happen or, you know, it just opened the door for a lot of communication and a lot of healing. And um, so it just kind of like my fear was about transportation and it started to manifest itself like when I was driving. Hi, Janie. So if anybody has any questions, you can drop those in the comments below. And so it was like this really weird time. Like I was dealing with my childhood trauma and my dad asked me if this had happened. And I had said to him, I would always say to people, if, if they asked, I would tell, but I would never disclose. And so I did disclose a child um, sexual abuse and I did share that with my dad. And that started like this whole like inner healing and, you know, kind of a shame spiral and other people knowing and this whole family blow up. So there was that dynamic going on. And I also was feeling very alone in my marriage. At that time, I probably was, it was around 2005. So that was right around us being together for five or seven years. And I felt very alone and I didn't really feel like I was supported, starting to feel like I was supported. And the weirdest thing is that my anxiety started happening on drives. And hi, Heidi. So my, my, I would be driving, and I'm very comfortable driving in a car, but there would be this sign that said, next exit, like 30 miles, or next rest area, 25 miles. And I don't know, it like started this whole little like piece of shrapnel in my brain. And it just was, you know, what if something happens? And there was just this insidious thing about all the what ifs that could happen. What if I got a flat tire? What if my car engine blew up? Like, and it would always be this stretch of driving where there would be nobody else on the road. And it was very freaky. And um, so I'd started to have racing heart and just had, you know, sweaty palms. I'd have to pull off the road. And then that happened for a few years. And then it was driving over bridges. So not only was that like driving on these isolated roads with like that sign that said 25 miles next exit, there was driving on bridges. 
And I think there was just this whole sense that nobody was really there to support me in this trauma space. And it manifested itself in anxiety and being alone. And um, so that went on for a little bit. I ended up in therapy. I had a wonderful therapist. And then from there, there was a night where there was this little bridge. It would it like would take one minute to get over. And I don't know what it was, but the ex wasn't wasn't home that night and I needed to get home and it was stressful at work. I was under a lot of pressure at I was a manager and I had 25 people reporting to me. So it was this pressure cooker and I felt all alone like there wasn't anybody supporting me. And it was very stressful. We had all these deadlines. And that night, I couldn't get home. Like, I couldn't drive over this one little bridge. And I was surprised that I just I, I just had a meltdown. I, I couldn't drive that one little one minute over this little hump of a bridge to get home. And so that was the first time that I had called somebody. And I called them. And they were so nice. It was a husband and wife. It was the first time that I ever like allowed somebody to help me. And obviously my dogs needed to get fed. So uh, they came and uh, I drove in their car and the husband drove my car home. And that really just showed me that, you know, you have to be brave sometimes to get help when you're in those mental spaces and not to be afraid that there are people. And the crazy thing is, is that in my life, I've had the most supportive strangers in my life. And most of the time with my family, I feel like there isn't that level of support. And so I think that that's part of some of my dynamic is that there just is this lack of support from my own family support system in an emotional space. I mean, they're there, but they're not really there in an emotional support space. And I feel very isolated and alone. And so that really helped me, you know, for a period of time. And for some reason, I started to have this fear of flying on planes. And I have flown all over the world. And it would manifest um, in a way where we get on, we get into the plane and there would be closing the door and then it was like, oh my God, like what if I like have a panic attack on the plane? Like, how's that gonna work? Like, and it and it was a lot of what I later found out was it was a lot of like mechanical noise that I was more kind of bothered by how loud it was and how the plane, you know, would take off and the trajectory. And so I did go to therapy for it, and we did a lot of exposure therapy for it. And I would sit in a chair, you know, on takeoff. We kind of figured out that it was on takeoff, that, that you know, having the plane go up like this. And so we, uh, I, it was before 9-11. And so I would go to the airport whenever I would need to fly. And like a week before, I would start watching the planes take off and and envision myself being on the plane. And um, I would practice being in a, a chair. I would have a chair from the kitchen and I would sit against the couch and I would do some mindfulness. And I really thought it, I really thought at that time it was very uh, mind, it was very mind oriented. And so uh, I was able to fly. I went on some, I called them experiential flights. So that's when you're practicing. And I went and saw a girlfriend um, down in San Diego. I had a successful flight. And, you know, I don't fly that often. So it's not one of those learned things like you're going to drive every single day. And, you know, there was this one time. So I had been working on this for like four or five years. And I was, you know, successfully would fly two or three times a year And I was like, okay, this is great. I kept my boarding pass and, you know, I was just really proud of myself. And then I went to go fly down with my friend to go see my friend. And I lived in Seattle. She lived in San Diego. 
And I was sitting in there and I was doing some breathing, relaxing breathing, and I was pretty calm. But the one thing that was happening that day was there was, uh, it was icing. So they had to put de-icer on the plane and there was all that chemical smell in the airport. Like you could smell all of the, I don't know what product it was, but it was just really overwhelming and it overstimulated me. And I remember like I got on the plane and I had been talking to a couple of people on there and I got on the plane and I was like, I sat down in my, my seat and I was like, okay, I think I can do this. You know, I've done my breathing. I've envisioned this, but for whatever reason, all I could imagine was like monkey mind and, you know, there was fear of the monkeys, and then there was monkeys had friends, and there was just monkeys all over the place. And, you know, there on my plane, it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been snakes on a plane or tarantulas or whatever. It would have been all filled with monkeys that day. And um, so this was the first time that I, that I actually had fight or flight. And I just couldn't be on that flight. And I actually got up and my, my luggage had already been loaded, and um, I, was, I was full on fight or flight. And I got off the plane, and I was halfway up the jetway when the flight attendant came after me. And there was this nice guy, Greg, that I had been talking to. He and his mom, we were all talking. And for whatever reason, like he was right there with the flight attendant, and and they're all like, where are you going? And I'm like, I don't think I can make this plane. And he said, right in the moment of the middle of fight or flight was, what if I sat with you? And I was like, you would do that for me? You don't even know me. Like, you're going to do that for me? And he said, yeah, yeah, I'll do that for you. And And right in that moment, like, I mean, you all know it, that fight or flight moment. Like you're just fleeing and you just have this, I am out of here. And he, and right at that moment, I was like, okay, I can do this. So I got back on the plane. The lady who was sitting next to me, she got moved off. She was like really angry about it. And I sat in the middle seat and I was like sweating. Like I, I am not a sweater, but I was sweating bullets. And, you know, Greg was just talking to me. And I made that flight. And for me, it's just takeoff. And Greg was so wonderful to be there in that very moment. Again, another stranger shows up like my angel, my flight angel is, you know, Greg shows up. And I was just like, wow, you know, this is like, wow, this is universe. This is God like sending me this person because if I didn't make that flight, that would be another setback. So I made it down there, saw my friend. I ended up going to an awesome massage therapist and she said, you're all tensed up. And I had had already scheduled a massage. And she said, you know, like what's going on? And I told her the story and she said to me, you know, you're never ever really alone. We all breathe in the same air. And I was like, wow, that's really profound. And if you really think about it, we all all connected through air. And I was like, wow, that's really great. And so anyway, uh, Greg and his mom. So, so the other thing about Greg was, I don't know who saved who. His mom looked really sweet. And maybe I was saving him from sitting with his mom or he'd been on a long vacation with her and needed a break. I don't know what it was, but I really appreciated having him on that flight. And I will see if I can find the photo of him. I have a photo of him and his mom and I'll see if I can find it and I'll post it in the group. But so that was, um, you know, a few years into the start of this flight thing that I was very diligent. I did not want to take medication and I don't want fear to control me. Like I still want to fly. There's places I want to see and I won't give into this. You know, it's something that I'm always going to challenge and it's, uh, it's something that I don't want it to control me. And there's a, there's a point where if you have anxiety that you really have to make friends with it and you also have to tell it who's boss. 
And, you know, I think with me, that's really a strategy that has been very helpful to me is that I'm not going to let it take part of my life, you know, driving or flying or visiting. And so anyway, so that was my flight. So fast forward, that was just a real quick down and back. And I hadn't really done, you know, from Seattle to San Diego, it was a shorter flight. And so I hadn't done one to go across country and I had to go on a business trip. So here I am, I'm like all prepped out, went and did my, my pre-flight to see my friend, had this great experience with Greg, got another uh, boarding pass to put in my pile. And I think I just recently got rid of those. I'm like, I don't need these anymore because it, there was a pretty good stack. And I was like, I got all of these up here. So I, I've got this. So fast forward, it's uh, like nine, it's like September 7th. And I'm a, I am a program manager at a software company and we're doing this very big presentation in Washington, D.C. So we fly in and there's myself and my team. And then there was a sales engineer. And we had two or three sales calls that we were doing throughout the Washington, D.C. area. And so we had done our sales call and and I made my flight successfully. It was awesome. I was like, I got this. And, you know, that was like the epitome of like, okay, I've worked through this. I did a cross country flight. Everything's awesome. And then 9-11 happens. Like my big thing of like a plane's going to crash. And not only on that day, there were multiple planes. And then it was incessantly on the news. And like I was away from home. I was away from my support system. I didn't have any of my support stuff and, you know, communication. You weren't able to get telephone calls out. I'm with these strange people that I don't really know. I mean, they're work buddies, but I don't really know them in that way. And it was really debilitating. And uh, so we all were hunkered down and where the office was, where I was located was only a few blocks from the Pentagon and you could smell the jet fuel, you could see the flames, you could you could feel the temperature difference in the air and you could hear all of the sirens going off and all of the emergency responders and it was quite the scene and you know we were hunkered down, uh, sheltered in place and here I am, I gotta get back home on a plane and, you know, when everybody else is fearful of flying. So anyway, we we had a great time. Um, I spent with these folks. We had barbecues. And at that time, there's like nobody's flying. I don't even know how I'm going to get home. And I called the airlines. And I'm kind of a superstitious person. But they were going to put me on the same aircraft that was leaving at the same flight of the one that took off from D.C. that landed at the Pentagon. And I just couldn't do it. And the the flight, the, the people at the service counter, they wouldn't let me change it to anything else. And, you know, that was just too much for my brain to have to navigate all of that. So I said I bailed on it. And my mom and dad lived about two or three hours from D.C., so I went and stayed with them. My mom wasn't home. My dad really wasn't all that helpful, uh, doesn't know how to be compassionate to those who are in stress. And I know he was trying to do the best he could, but at that moment, I just wasn't in very much receive mode because now I'm in stress mode because I got to get back on a plane after 9-11 to get home. So make a long story short, <laughs> the way that I decided to do it was I took a train. The only flight I could get was out of Chicago. And so I took a train, an Amtrak train that was like 14 hours to get to Chicago. And it was packed. I got like one of the last seats on the Amtrak to go north because, I mean, all of the rental cars were 
Uh, there was no rental cars to be had. There was no flights to be had. It was just chaos. And now I have to fly home with my fear of flying. So I get to Chicago after 14 hours on a train and uh, there was a lot of cool people, a lot of good stories and it was really upbeat. And I get to Chicago and I'm like, there's only eight people like on our flight to go from Chicago to Denver. And then I got to Denver and then there was Denver into Seattle. And so I made it home, but that really tripped me up for about another uh, seven years. I really couldn't do flying after that for a bit. And I had to work up to getting back into me making an effort to get over this fear of flying after I had done so well. And so, you know, after really digging in a little bit more about this fear of flying, I figured out that there were some things, you know, therapy was helpful. It helped me to understand how my brain was working. But it, but there was another thing for me that I didn't understand about myself was I'm a highly sensitive person. And so there is that mechanical noise and the trajectory and all of the power boost when the plane takes off that just is not normal. And, you know, at that time, I decided to start wearing headphones. Like I would turn up, I have like this awesome playlist of Christian music and it's upbeat. And, and you know, for me, I was like, you know, they want you to listen to the, the safety uh, rhetoric on the plane with the, with the flight attendants. And for me, I'm just kind of like, I'm listening to my music. I'm not going to, I'm going to be the rebel. So I wouldn't listen to anything that they would say. I wouldn't even look at them. But that was helpful to be able to have music and to drown out that sound. It helped like take the edge off from the mechanical sound. So for me, it was it was overstimulation for, you know, the power of the plane taking off and and all of that that I got worked up in my head. And, you know, every single time I think about those kind strangers that I've I've run across and, um, you know, there are people who are very anxious about flying and, you know, you see little kids and everything else. And so I, I've spent a long time working on this, like probably like 18 years working on this fear of flying. And, you know, in the last like five years, I've taken probably four or five trips every single year. And there are some things that I have to be aware of when I travel and, you know, I understand my triggers. You know, I've done the work to understand my triggers. And there definitely are some creature comforts that I have. So therapy has been very helpful. Mindfulness, knowing how I have to prepare for going to the airport. And for me, I'm one of those people that I like to be at the airport exactly two hours ahead of time. Like, I don't want to be rushed through security. I don't want to have to manhandle luggage or anything else. I would rather pay the fee to not have to truck through security all my check on carry on bags. So for me, it's about easiness getting to the airport. So that's uh, usually taking a Uber. Now that I'm single, I take a Uber. I know exactly when I need to call the Uber and how long it's going to be for them to get here. I make sure that I check my bags and I've got a little secret thing going on now that if you have a carry on that if you go up to the counter and say, you know, if they're looking to board uh, quickly, they will take a bunch of carry ons and they'll they'll allow you to check them right at the bottom of the ramp. So that's my other tip is I do that every single time. And for me, I have to do cold therapy. And it's a lot about my nervous system, and I've learned how to make friends with my nervous system. And for me, cold therapy really helps. It uh, I have to take a cold bath the night before, and I usually stay in about 15 minutes, and that really helps me out. It really chills my nervous system out, and you don't have to have that fancy ice that everybody else does for these cold plunges. And so cold therapy works for me not being stressed out, taking time, not being rushed. Like I can't, 
and I don't drink coffee the morning of, so I, I don't want to have any stimulant that's going to activate my nervous system or activate my, my anxiety. And I also try to go for a walk. Like in the airport, I usually carry a backpack and I usually walk in the airport and I get a good heart rate going in my two hours and I usually have my tracker. So I'm doing a lot of exercise. So we talked this morning about a few things, you know, for me, we talked about exercise this morning being one of the 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 uh, hacks for anxiety. That's perfect. And for me, I have to be up the night before. Like I want to be like totally sleep deprived for when I get on the plane. That really helps me as well. And it's kind of a reverse of what I shared with you today is the three hacks is sleeplessness. You want to get a full night's sleep. You want to have exercise and then self-talk. I just make sure that I am super tired when I get on a plane. So for me, <clears throat> there was a component of mindfulness and, and brain stuff that was going on, but a large portion of it was my body and, and how the anxiety and the stress and, and making friends with cold therapy really helped to chill me out. So it was less about my brain and less about my mental health than it was about my body. And so I'm, I'm just really sharing this because a lot of times there's a lot of different components. There are layers to anxiety and, you know, that, that one thing that works for somebody may not work for you. And maybe that one thing that works for somebody else will work for you. And I think anxiety and, and fears are things that you have to find your own rhythm with and you have to find your own things that work for you. And so, you know, that's, that's a really big thing is therapy for me has been helpful. Mindfulness, you know, understanding that I have a schedule that I need to go through and things that I need to do. Most of it is lifestyle. So it's going to bed knowing that I like to be tired when I'm on a plane, doing cold therapy the the night before or the morning before, having no coffee, no stimulants. I'm not going to have tea or anything. I'm just going to drink water. I have snacks that I have on the plane. I don't really like to eat, you know, usually what's ever offered on the plane. And exercise, I walk in the airport. So a lot of those are lifestyle body issues that can be very helpful for anxiety. And self-talk really goes a long way. And the other thing that I have, have played around with and that I have done a lot of work with is inner child, inner child connection. And so um, I am going to show you what my inner girl she actually brings this on the plane and this is comfort for her. And sometimes I bring coloring books and yeah, my inner child likes to have her stuffed animal with her. And if anybody's going to say anything, I'm going to have kids. I, I have kids that gave this to me, but I'll claim it, you know, I claim it to anybody else, but this really helps my inner child to stay focused. And she has something that's cuddly and warm and that soothes her. And that's something that I'm very a big proponent of is inner child work and play and befriending your inner child. And, you know, I know on the last couple of flights, there were some unusual things that happened. And uh, one of them was, what was it? I went on this big conference and there was just so much going on and I couldn't really do all of the things that were necessary. I couldn't get a cold bath in. I took a cold shower and it didn't do what it needed to do. So I went to the airport and there, I, I had to really talk to my inner child after I boarded the plane. I was starting to get a little bit of anxiousness, but I was like, you know what? I got you we're good. You know, we ha I had to do some self-talk around it and just like get inward with my inner child and just really help her to relax. And so that really helped on that flight. And this last flight from Texas, <laughs> there was no cold water to be had. 
And, uh, you know, in Texas, it is so warm, even the ground, like even the cold water is not really all that cold. And I wished I had a thermometer because it probably was like 70 degrees. And when I take a cold bath here, it's 60 degrees. So I didn't have that cold therapy blast as I had wanted. And again, I could just tell that there was just a little bit of remnants, but I was able to work through it. And yeah, I'm flying out. I just made my flight reservations for Texas for my final departure from Portland to Texas. And I made that today and I'll be flying with Kitty Cat. So I also, uh, Reddy will be taking his new flight. And so I will have my child with me. I'll have my fur baby with me on this flight. So I just, I just wanted to share that there are, yes, Christian music. I have a wonderful playlist. And Janie, if you have a playlist, I would love to hear that. And reading Bible, yeah, totally awesome. And yeah, inner child uh, painting and coloring, I love that too. So yeah. Okay, well, if you're from Texas, I don't know where you live now, but I'd love to meet up. I love that. So, you know, I just I just wanted to end and share that there are a lot of layers to anxiety, and sometimes it's not just a mindfulness, and it's not just um, a mental health issue, that there are a lot of layers to this. There can be layers of trauma. There could be connection with your inner child. There could be environmental. You could be a highly sensitive person and very uh, connected or overstimulated by what's going on around you. That would be interesting to dig into. Um, you know, and I learned about the kindness of strangers, you know, having Greg on that flight and and also the other people that have come to my aid at times and the person who drove me over that little mini bridge, um, I love those people, uh, Nancy and Tom. And cold therapy, you know, there's a lot of other uh, therapies that can really help to desensitize, to help chill out your nervous system. And so, you know, if that's something that you struggle with or, you know, want to peel back or whatever, um, you know, drop a drop a comment. You know, it's it's a it's a big complex puzzle that needs to be taken apart like a jigsaw puzzle. And sometimes, you know, going to a therapist, they don't know a lot about body modalities and breathing techniques that can help with stress reduction and and different ways to try on whatever it is that you're anxious about. And so that's something that I enjoy helping others to dial into, hey, what is it that you're fearful of, you know, asking questions and really understanding what's going on with their trauma or their life or their stress level or where where whatever is going on in their life. It's a jigsaw puzzle and having somebody else to help you take those pieces apart to kind of help you put other pieces back together can be very helpful and having somebody who is not in your world can be a really good person to help out with that. So I just wanted to offer that up and share my story. And I know that anxiety and depression is two things that I have struggled with. So I am card carrying anxiety and I'm going to continue to friend my anxiety and yeah, I'll be talking tomorrow about depression. And I'm happy to share about my walk with depression and grieving after my marriage and after my divorce and how that really impacted me. So yeah, if there's anything else, if you have any questions or whatever, I'd be happy to answer questions. Or if you have anything that you come up with later, you can put drop them in the comments and I'm happy to you know, shed light or share an experience or whatever else. Um, you know, I've really enjoyed having all you ladies on here tonight and I look forward to carrying on the conversation about how we can make some lifestyle changes that can help with stress reduction in all of the things that we may be experiencing, whether we're single, we're going through a divorce, we're healing from narcissistic abuse, or whatever we're walking in life, there are a lot of components that kind to that kind of come together 
in this age and time that we're navigating as we get older, the 40 plus. And we've also got menopause and we've got hormones and we've got ageism if we're looking for a job. And there's a lot of that going on. And so there's a lot of puzzle pieces that need to be taken apart to put back into a different picture. And maybe the pieces look different and maybe the shape is a little different, but you know, there can be a really great puzzle that comes back together when you understand all of those pieces. So thank you for joining me live. And I look forward to talking with you guys tomorrow about depression. Take care. Bye-bye.